Well, good morning and welcome again to our online Bible study. Our theme, of course, on Friday, again, is Your Kingdom Come. Again, this is taken from the Lord's Prayer where Jesus taught us to pray, Your Kingdom Come on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done. Your Kingdom Come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So again, we just emphasize this over and over that Jesus is telling us that it's our role and it's what we are to concentrate on is answering that prayer that the kingdom of God, he wants it to become a reality on the earth. And how is he going to do that? We're his hands and feet and legs. We're the ones to bring the kingdom of God into reality on this earth. Today the subtitle is Humility, Humility. And we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 18 verses 1 through 6. In that hour the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is greater in the kingdom of heaven? And having called forward a little child, Jesus set him in their midst. So Jesus chose a little boy and had him come up in front of everybody. So Jesus set him in their midst and he said, Truly I say to you, unless you convert and become as the little children, not at all can you enter into the kingdom of heaven. Then whoever will humble himself as this little child, this one is the greater in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever will receive one such little child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones believing in me to offend, which means to trip up or entice to sin, it is better for him that a millstone turned by an ass be hung on his neck and he be sunk in the depths of the sea. Okay. In the context of this, if we believe that this is following or tracking chronologically Jesus had in chapter 17 he had gone up on the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter James and John and while he was on the mountaintop Moses and Elijah appeared on that mountain and Peter spoke up and said, Lord, do you want us to build three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah? He didn't know what to say. He was just awestruck by what was happening. And he knew, he knew that he knew that he knew that this was Moses and Elijah. Nobody had to tell him. Nobody said, hey, this is Moses or this is Elijah. They just knew who Moses and Elijah were. So if this be the case, some feel like that that took place at the Feast of Tabernacle or during that time frame because during the Feast of Tabernacles they would build little booths for people to dwell in during that week-long celebration. I don't know. It's possible. If that's true, though, that would have occurred in the fall of the year. And we know that the way things are tracking here, that Jesus, by chapter 18, he knows that his time is drawing very short. So if the visit up on the Mount of Trans Transfiguration occurred in the fall, you wouldn't think it would be in the winter. It would be too cold to be up there. But possibly in the fall, then by spring, we know that Jesus would be crucified. So Jesus does his the hourglass in other words is running out. Jesus knows that his time is running out here on this earth. And t 
time after time, even after that incident, he tried to warn or prepare his disciples for what was ahead. Now, unfortunately, it just went right over their heads. I mean, it just went in one ear and out the other. They didn't want to hear that message. They were excited because their concept, if Jesus were the Messiah, and here Peter, James, and John had saw Moses and Elijah with Jesus up on that mountaintop, and, you know, that was awesome, and, you know, you can just imagine what was going through their minds. So if Jesus were really the Messiah, then uh, they had a concept of what the Messiah was to be that was totally different than the reality, at least at this time frame. Yes, um, there are two different pictures of the Messiah in the scripture. There is a, des a description of the Messiah ruling and reigning and sitting on the throne of David, but there's also a picture of the Messiah who is the suffering servant, who is brutally lashed at a whipping post and impaled on an execution stake. We see in Isaiah, for example, Isaiah presents both sides of the coin, the, the ruling and reigning Messiah, and also on the other side of the coin, the suffering servant. For example, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. He said, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. But on the other hand, in Isaiah 53, 5, Isaiah sees the suffering servant, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us shalom or peace. And with his wounds or his stripes, we are healed. So we see also, I didn't include it here, but it, it talks about in this chapter how the Messiah would be despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. So like I said, we've got two sides of the coin. We have the ruling, reigning Messiah who will sit on the throne, who will sit and reign on this earth, and we know that will happen during the millennial reign, but we also have a Messiah who has to go through suffering and even death that we see in Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22 and other scriptures that point to the fact that we will have a Messiah who will go through a time of tribulation himself. But for the disciples, with them having the concept of a ruling, reigning Messiah in their minds, well, they also began to have thoughts of what that would mean for them. If Jesus was going to sit on the throne of David in Jerusalem, and they would be going, probably in a few days, they would be going to Jerusalem, and we know on Palm Sunday, you know, the crowds that were crying Hosanna as Jesus entered into Jerusalem. So you can just imagine what was going through the minds of his disciples. And they were thinking, oh, wow, if Jesus sits on the throne, what about us? If we've been chosen to be his disciples. What will he do for us? <clears throat> Who would he pick to be or choose to be one of the highest ranking members of his cabinet, so to speak? Who would sit on his right or in, on his left in his kingdom? This was a question that uh, James and John were asking Jesus. Can we sit on your right and on your left in your kingdom? 
So who would be doing that? Who would be at those positions of great honor in his kingdom? Would it be Peter, James, John? They usually were the inner circle of Jesus. They went where the other disciples were not allowed to go with Jesus. Or what about Judas? Hmm, this treasure. You know, from outward appearance, some people said that from his qualifications, he would probably be... be most people's pick of being a disciple of Jesus just from his qualifications. These fishermen, no, we wouldn't have chosen them. But, you know, that just shows that God sees the heart of man, doesn't it? But just think about it. If he did choose Peter or James or John to sit on his right or his left to be holding the highest positions in his kingdom... What a promotion that would be. And for a fisherman to be selected? Wow. So what would be going through their minds? Would it be dreams of wealth or fame, fortune, power? Oh, we're going to get chariots. We're going to ride around in chariots. We're going to live in palaces or find homes. Maybe all these things were going around and around in their mind. Probably was, wasn't it? They were thinking about this. But just to make sure that they wouldn't be unqualified or disqualified or ineligible for such positions, they asked Jesus to tell them specifically what the criteria for greatness in his, his kingdom meant. What was Jesus looking for? You know, they wanted to make sure that they demonstrated those characteristics or demonstrated that ability before Jesus just to showcase and say look look this is what I can do I can handle this you've you've got the right man here so I, it's a very good question I'm sure that those that have been in the workforce they probably thought about those things if um, if they are in the lower ranks of the company thinking about how can I get promoted? How can I get a better job? What qualities are you looking for in a leader, in someone for a higher position? Those are very good questions if you want to get promoted. But Jesus, I think he took them all by surprise as he looked around that crowd and he saw a little boy how do we know that it was a little boy? Because in verse 2 it said that he brought him and that he stood before them. And then in verse 3 he said, Truly, I say to you, unless you convert and become as the little children, not at all can you enter into the kingdom of heaven. If you don't become, if you don't convert or change or become like a little child, there's not any way that you can enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now why a little child? What did Jesus see in, in the little child? What, what was the mark of greatness inside of the little child? Now he brought forth a, a little boy. Don't know how old he was, but he brought him up and had him stand before them all. And he said, unless you become like little children, you can't enter into the kingdom of God. Well, for one thing, they're fresh out of the pot, so to speak. They're fresh out of heaven. They've been sent by the Father. We came. We are God's offspring. We were with the Father as spiritual beings, and we still are spiritual beings. We're body, soul, and spirit. We were spiritual beings living inside of the Father before we came here to this earth. Now, a little child hasn't lived long enough to be tainted by the world. Well, we have to say in the world of that day, because things have really changed in today's society because we have technology and 
we have television and movies and computers and cell phones and iPads and even small little children have cell phones or iPads. But in that day, they didn't have those things. They weren't exposed to the world like children are today. They weren't tainted by the world and by the, the world's philosophies. So I can't say it so much today because the outside world is infiltrating into our homes more and more as time goes on. And that can be a good thing. It just depends. You have to filter and screen out what children are able or should watch in the home. If they're not filtered or screened, then they are they sometimes can be exposed to very evil things in our world. But back in the day of Jesus, his time, when he was here on this earth, that wasn't the case. It was the home, it was the family that was the influence on their children. So little children have an innocence or a blind trust in those in authority over them. Now we know today there's a lot of abuse that is happening in homes and families. And again, we can say, well, what is the root cause of that? But again, I think it's these outside influences that are infiltrating into our homes and that has really changed our culture over the decades since I was a child. And I've seen how things have really changed in the, <clears throat> in the media, in entertainment, and all these things. But what Jesus specifically mentioned about the little children and what he pointed out was their humility. So in verse 4 he said, Then whoever will humble himself, as this little child, this little boy, this one is the greater in the kingdom of heaven. And so he pointed out humility. You know, we don't, in our society, we don't look at humility as a virtue to pursue. There's a lot of things that we might point to, but humility might not be number one on our list. But that was number one on Jesus' list. Could be because of the fact that the disciples were arguing over who was going to be the greatest in this kingdom. Maybe it was because of their arrogance or their pride or their ambition. Maybe that was it. It was their ambition. They wanted to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Wouldn't that be great? But why is humility so important? That if you don't have humility, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Shouldn't we exude confidence or a certain pride in our accomplishments or express an assertiveness or aggressiveness? I mean, this is what, in the major cities especially, you see a lot of assertiveness and a lot of aggressiveness, a lot of confidence, and bordering maybe or even going over into arrogance and pride. I think some of the investigations that are going on in our um, deep state and some of the players that have been before Congress and the total, utter arrogance of some of those people is just very repulsive. The book of Proverbs has this to say about humility. Proverbs 18.12, Before destruction... A man's heart is haughty, but humility comes before honor. So we could say it another way. Pride comes before destruction. Pride. Pride comes before destruction. Having an arrogance or a pride, that will come before destruction. 
Proverbs 22, 4 says, The reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. Do you know that the Bible said that Moses was the meekest man on the face of the earth? And again, meekness, humility, we kind of equate those two terminologies, those two words. Humility. He was the meekest man on the face of the earth. Even though he was the one that went up on Mount Sinai and met face to face with Almighty God, with Yahweh. He was in the smoke and the cloud up on the mountaintop. Everybody else was scared to death and said, No, we're not going up that mountain. We're afraid. And yet they thought he had died up there and very quickly turned away and had Aaron make them a golden calf so they could worship. Let's worship this God, not the one up on the mountaintop. But even Moses, he prayed and interceded even after the golden calf incident. He prayed and interceded for his own brother and sister. His sister developed leprosy because he, she and Aaron were criticizing Moses. And they were saying, we're just as good as he. You know, we could, you know, why do we have to listen to him? And as a result of her bad-mouthing and her criticism and that the Lord says, I, I will not honor that. You do not. That's not how you are promoted in the kingdom of God. It's not by putting other people down. And then in the New Testament we have the Apostle Paul who had a couple of things to say to the churches about humility. To the church at Philippi he said, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. You know, why are we doing it? Is it for what we can get out of it. Remember the time that Peter said, well, Lord, we've left houses and lands and our homes, our families. What will we get out of it? And Jesus said, well, you'll get houses and lands and family and all these things and persecution and in the world to come eternal life. But there was, you know, inside of them... That selfish ambition. Who's going to sit on your right? Who's going to sit on your left? Oh, look at us. We were up on Mount Transfiguration. Aren't we special? But Paul said, But in humility count others more significant than yourselves. So in humility, you know, honor other people rather than yourself. You know, when you try to put yourself forward and when you're trying to be ambitious and want a certain position, a certain place, you know, it, it goes on in churches. They want a certain role. They want to be the, the soloist in the choir or the music director. They want to hold this position on the board or, you know, so it goes on. There's a lot of ambitious people or conceited people within our ranks. But Paul said, in humility, count others more significant than yourself. To the church at Colossi, Colossi he told them that there were certain qualities, certain virtues that they needed to clothe themselves with. So he said, put on as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, or gentleness, and patience. So he lists humility in the very heart of these virtues that we need to clothe ourselves with. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And then 
Jesus ends his discussion with his disciples about this by saying, And whoever will receive one such little child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones believing in me to offend or to trip up or entice to sin, it is better for him that a millstone turned by an ass be hung on his neck and he be sunk in the depth of the sea. A millstone was a huge circular stone that was used in a grist, excuse me, a grist mill that they would grind their wheat or their grain. And it would weigh up to, well, there were two circular stones. One at the bottom was stationary. The one at the top was uh, where you could turn it around and around. So it was loose so you could turn it around. And it was the one that did the grinding or caused the grinding to take effect. And those millstones would weigh like 1,500 pounds. So you're talking about heavy, heavy stones. And Jesus said, if you trip up or you entice to sin one of these little ones, then it would be better for you to put a millstone around your neck and drown in the depths of the sea. That's pretty harsh. So what Jesus was saying that true greatness comes from nurturing and developing future generations in the things of the Lord. In fact, let's look at Deuteronomy and see what it says there. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 through 9. And these words that I command you today, this is Moses speaking, and, uh, speaking for the Lord. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise. So we're to be teaching our future generation from the time they get up in the morning till the time they go to bed. He goes on to say in verse 8, You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The Jewish people have what they call the mezuzah, which is a little cylinder where they put a very small replica of a, a Jewish uh, scroll of the scriptures of this particular scripture and they would put it roll it up and put it in this little cylinder and they would attach it to the gates and on the doorposts doorpost of their house as a reminder to them of what they were to do that this is your assignment you're to teach future generations. You're to teach your children, your grandchildren. Talk about it when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you get up. We should be teaching and training them the things of God. But now we have just turned over the teaching and the training to our schools, our colleges, our universities. But what are we allowing those schools and colleges and universities to teach our children? In many instances, it's socialism, transgenderism, it's sexual immorality, women's choice, globalism, and so forth. So what are we doing? We're enticing our children to sin. We're exposing them to things that they should never, never even think about. There are schools that have them learn about Islam and repeat words from the Koran. They're, they're teaching children that they can decide whether they want to be a boy or a girl. What are we teaching our children? We're enticing our children to sin. And we're going to be the ones that are going to be held accountable to the Lord for this. This is what Jesus said. 
whoever causes one of these little ones believing in me to offend or trip up and entice to sin. It is better for him that a millstone turned by an ass be hung on his neck and he be sunk in the depth of the sea. Jesus said, do not trip up or entice a little child to sin. You are the one that is supposed to be teaching them diligently the things of the Lord. You need to be doing that from the time you get up in the morning, when you are sitting around the house, when you're walking uh, uh, down the road or taking a walk, when you lie down, from the time you get up in the morning till the time you go to bed, we need to be teaching our children the things of the Lord. Because they're not going to hear it from the world. They're not going to hear it a lot of times from television or the movies that they watch. Unless you're screening and that you're making sure that your children are watching the right things. What they can see on their iPhones or iPads or listen to on iPods. I mean, this is very, very serious. True greatness is humility. True greatness is hearing the words of the Lord and saying, yes, Lord. Like, like Samuel. Remember Samuel was dedicated to the Lord by his mother. She had, she had been childless and she had prayed and she had made a vow that if the Lord would give her a son that that she would dedicate him to the Lord for the rest of his life. And God heard her prayer, and she fulfilled her vow. And Samuel, as a little boy, he began to hear the voice of God. He didn't know the voice of God. He didn't understand that it was the Lord. He thought it was the priest, who he was living with the priest, Eli, at the time. And he kept getting up in the middle of the night and saying, Father Eli, did you call me? What do you want? And Eli kept saying, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. And three different times that happened. And finally Eli says, well, if you hear the voice of the Lord again, you say, here I am. Tell me what you want me to know. And as a little boy, Samuel heard the voice of God. And he became one of the greatest men in Israel. He was the last of the judges. He was a anointed by God, a prophet, and a judge. And he was led by the Lord from a boy. And he uh, was able to anoint the first and second kings of Israel, King Saul and then King David. He anointed both of them to be the kings of Israel, their first and second kings. A very great man, the scripture says that his words did not fall to the ground. When he spoke, people listened. But that won't happen unless we intentionally pray and we teach our children what they need to know because we live in a society today, in a world today, where the enemy is doing everything that he can to destroy, to destroy our homes, to destroy our churches, to destroy our nation. And we just need to stand strong. And we need to make sure that we are teaching those future generations what it means to be truly great. It's truly great when we humble ourselves before the Lord and we say, here I am, Lord. Choose me. Use me. So I pray for our children. I pray for the future generations. I pray for our nation. Because if we don't teach our children the things that they need to know now. What will the future be like? 
So, Father, help us to be truly humble, not trying to get ahead in the kingdom of God, but just doing your will and following you wherever you would lead us and whatever you want us to do. And we thank you and we praise you for it, Lord. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.